For many years, many of us have watched the, the, the trials and tribulations of Bob Kuykendall, figuring out how he was going to turn into the only U.S. sailplane manufacturer. And uh, somehow, uh, despite our best efforts to help him out, uh, he figured out how to do this. And uh, um, it is with great pleasure that uh, Bob comes back and talks to us all the time to let us know what he's been thinking lately. So Bob, take it away. Thank you, Al. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me on the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Al, thank you for the introduction. You, you uh, drove me right up to where I need to start this. Um, as the, well, not the only U.S. manufacturer of sailplanes, um, and when it comes down to it, I'm not really a manufacturer of sailplanes, but I do make a, a lot of big parts, and when you add them all up, they do add up to sailplanes. Um, and I have come here, this, this is literally the almost the 20th year that I've come back and stood in front of you and, and talked to, with you about the trials and tribulations and showing you photo after photo after photo of carbon fiber stuff turned inside out or not yet turned right side in. And, and I've come to realize that I don't really know all that much about this stuff. <laughs> and the more I do it, the more I realize how little I actually know. And the more I understand how little I know, the easier it is to move forward and find what I need to know, find out what I need to know, figure out how to apply it, and figure out how to move forward. And I've come to understand that the unifying factor in all these trials and tribulations, the unifying factor in all of the advances that I've made is teamwork, is people working together towards a common goal um, using shared resources and basically uh, using community as a force multiplier to do things that are pretty, sometimes pretty nearly impossible. Um, and by the way, from an AP perspective, I'm driving blind, so I'm going down the highway here looking in my rearview mirror. Um, so, and I just put these slide, this slide deck together, so I'm not entirely sure what's next. So I have to look over my shoulder for what's next. And it's, oh yes, this is me. This is the glider I designed, developed. I'm trying to avoid more and more saying this is the glider I designed, because saying it's designed kind of presupposes that I went into it with a plan, executed on that plan, and resulted in this big, white, shiny thing that you see in front of you. When in fact, what I did is bumble into it, make many mistakes and, and wrong turns, and follow many misdirected leads, um, before eventually arriving at a path that delivered this thing you see before you. Um, what's next? And this is, this is the question I came to answer. This is the rhetorical question I'm going to start with. This is the question I'm going to end with. Why is teamwork important? Um, and reason number one, I know this is the next slide. Reason number one is simple, simple time. This is the number of hours we have in every year. And nobody, no matter how rich or how resourceful they are, gets more than that. You get a little shy of 9,000 minutes every year. If you're lucky, you get to spend almost 3,000 of those minutes sleeping. Hours? Um, hours. Hours, yes. 3,000, about 3,000 hours sleeping. Um, you spend about, if you're like me, if you're still working, if you're not retired yet, um, if you still subsidize what you do on the weekends by what you do on the weekday, you're going to spend about 2,000 of those hours at work and that leaves you a little shy of 4,000 hours to, to do everything, everything else. Um, meals, tying your shoes, time spent with your family, trips to Disneyland, it all comes out of this 4,000 hours. And if you want to design and develop and build an airplane, you're going to need more than this. Um, my personal experience um, is that this 4,000 hours um, is about a quarter of the time that it takes to come up with something like that glider I showed you before. And um, you'd have to be really, really fortunate in order to get all 4,000 of those hours out of, it, out of that year. My experience is the typical airplane home builder, sailplane home builder, 
gets about a quarter of that. You get about a thousand hours in your weekends and your evenings. And my direct experience from the HP24 project is that to make this glider, I'm going to back up and show it to you. Because as I've learned and as I've said before, um, once you design and develop and build a 15 meter racing sailplane, you will never ever get tired of showing people pictures of it. <laughs> um, this is about 15,000 hours of development. When I add up the numbers, when I add up the years, when I add up the weekends, when I look at the ACA fleets, when I look at what other people have come and done with me and for me, it's about 15,000 hours between when, when I first had this bright, shiny idea for a modern kit-built sailplane, and when the first one flew in 2012, that was about 15,000 hours in 12 years. And, boy howdy, it wasn't all mine. Um, so, teamwork was very, very important as ever. Teamwork got us to where we, we are now, and I didn't figure this out until very late in the program, and now I'm hoping you guys can learn from my mistakes in thinking I could set out on this and be the one guy to do it all. Um, time. We've been there. We've done that. What else? Resources. It takes a lot more than time. Um, number one, I mean, let's start at the bottom of the list. Floor space. You want to make a 15 meter sailplane, right? You're going to have about 100 square feet. And you think, oh, it's 100 square feet. No, it's not 100 square feet of molds. It's 200 square feet of molds because your wing has a top and it's got a bottom. And your molds have flanges and your molds have footprint to walk around. So floor space, you're talking about 500 square, 500 square feet. If you want to do it all in parallel and have them all available at once. Um, tools. It takes an incredible number of tools to make anything in aviation. Um, Cars, motorcycles, machinery that has a lot of mass margin often contains its own alignment fixture. You start, you start with this chassis and you start bolting stuff onto it. But with airplanes, you end up leaving all that stuff on the ground. Um, so you need lots of tools. You need materials. You've got to make this stuff out of something. You need to buy services because you can't do everything else. You can't do everything yourself. So you're going to need welding. You're going to need some analysis. You might need some 3D, you know, you're, you're probably going to need some laser cut parts, CNC parts, all this stuff. And when you're working on your own, it's kind of hard to, to come up with all this all on your own. Teamwork. You find people, they bring it to you. Aptitudes. This, this is probably the big one. Aptitudes. I know of about five people in the world who have all the aptitudes that it takes to, to do what, I did, what I've done slowly and with everybody's help. Um, it, there's like five people in the world who can do all this. Probably about three of them are in this room today. And think about this. Who's got aerodynamics? Everybody learns a little aerodynamics at getting a pilot license. I did. Who learns structures? Well, you go, you go to university and you take statics, you take dynamics, um, you take computational fluid dynamics, you do some other stuff. Um, stability and control, that's, that's a key one. That's NASA territory. Um, estimating performance. Um, arriving at configuration, weighing the costs and benefits of canard versus conventional, T-tail, regular tail, all this stuff. Um, fortunately, a lot of this, so the nature of soaring machinery is such that uh, it operates in a rather tightly converged solution space, which is to say that a lot of these problems have been solved, and we're also funneling everything into these white blobs that we fly that all basically look the same, and they all look the same for a reason. In any case, you need some aeroelastics, or at least you need to make some guesses. You need some mechanical engineering, some mechanical... And by the way, as I discovered this project, mechanical design is a lot more important than mechanical engineering. Um, and I believe that design, I've, and I think that history bears me out on this, that, we, that design is a, a separate discipline from engineering. The way I like to think of it is design is where you get an idea for an arrangement of parts that achieves 
uh, an outcome. And mechanical engineering is where you, pretty, where you figure out how big and how hefty and how strong and these, all these parts need to be in the materials and all that stuff. And, um, to a living fixture, you need somebody who knows to, who can figure out, based on your bright, shiny idea, how to make the molds, the tools, the fixtures, the jigs, the alignment stuff that turns it from a collection of materials into a collection of shapes. Teamwork has in and of itself, motivation. We, and I'm going to read this because it's important. We all go through phases of excitement, despair, and resolve. And we often go through these, all these phases a couple of times a week. And what I found from working on this project is that working with a team is essentially a force multiplier because you get, all, you get, you get basically a waveform that goes through all these phases, and if you can superimpose a bunch of waveforms on top of each other, you can help avoid the lows and accentuate the highs. Teamwork is important because it's easy to see stuff get done, because there's more of you doing it, you're putting in more of those hours that we talked about first, you pooled your resources so you have more tools and more aptitudes, more is getting done, and when you see stuff get done, it's easier to get more stuff done. So I gotta say, um, when I go to my big tin building, about as big as this, in the middle of winter, and nobody's there, and I've gotta make a bunch of small parts, man, that big, cold, echoey space just sucks the motivation right out of me. And it's very easy to arrive at some sort of uh, gumption trap, they call it in Zen the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. You arrive at a gumption trap, you can't find a tool, something breaks, you say, ah, oh, screw this, I'm going home. And that day is turned into zero. You get nothing done. When you've got other people around, stuff's getting done, you see stuff getting done, you arrive at some sort of discontinuity, and it's much easier to bridge that discontinuity. You can say, oh, well, look at this. We're, Let's keep, the, let's keep the energy going, and you figure a workaround, and you find a way to keep going, and, and you find that you have a lot fewer of these days where you get hitched, you get shut down, and you lose the rest of the day. Where are we on? Vision! I started this project with a vision. This idea that there should be somewhere in the world some place where you can buy a big box of parts and assemble from that box of parts a racing sailplane with the performance and amenities you expect from a European racing sailplane at some modest fraction of the cost of the manufactured thing with, in exchange for contributing um, uh, the acceptance of a certain amount of risk, both financial and and opportunity, and that you should put a bunch of work into it. I, I came into it with this vision, and I, I found that it didn't really establish much traction until I found other people who shared that vision with me. Um, and let me back up one slide. Let me see if I can back up one slide. Yes, yes, motivation and vision are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, this picture here, I'm going to share a bit of vision with you. That picture there is the first time I ever saw my glider. That's the first time I ever had an idea what this thing was going to look like. Because I designed in 2D. I'm old school. I'm basically one step above the drafting table. I use an old uh, CAD CAM program called CorelDRAW. It's now a, now a product of the same Canadian company that puts out WordPerfect for people who just won't give up on WordPerfect and won't move to Word and, and that Google stuff in the cloud, no way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I use CorelDRAW. I design in 2D. I design in slices. I look at it from the top. I look at it from the side. And I look at it from the front. And I kind of integrate these in my head. And I make drawings based on these integrations. And I kind of slice and dice my way between where I am and where I need to go. 
in 2003, I was giving a talk like the one I'm giving to you now at the Seattle Museum of Flight, and this guy pokes his hand up and says, hey, Bob, um, I do 3D design. I bet I, could, I bet I could model your glider pretty easy based on these slices you're showing us. And that's how I met Brad Hill. That's how I met Brad Hill, and that's how I learned that I shared with this man a vision of a glider you build in your garage that goes like stink. And Brad and I, between the two of us, found that we could put about, between the two of us, we found we could put about four times our own resources into it just by the force multiplication factor of, whoops, of avoiding despair, avoiding those shutdown days, avoiding those low cycles of the waveform that kind of slice the bottom out of your hours. Between the two of us, we had fewer of these days, we, and, and yeah, it wasn't just our multiplication. We got more done in those hours because I knew he needed stuff. He, he knew I needed stuff. And the very important thing with, with that, with that vision that I shared with Brad, is that Brad held this vision with a, a degree that was probably stronger than mine. And when it came time for Brad to be making his glider, he would call me up every week and say, Bob, I need wings. What's your plan for getting me wings? I need a tail. When are we going to start making these parts? I need these detailed drawings to, to install this. When am I going to get that? And if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for Brad sharing this vision with me and pushing me as hard as he could, we probably wouldn't be flying one of these things. We, we probably have zero flying. We have two flying. And let me tell you, two is a lot more than zero. And it's going to be three, four, and five pretty soon. And all because I've learned that I can share the vision with other people, and they will reinforce my motivation and put all together, we're going to get more done. I think I'm nearing the end of this deck. Let me talk something weird about soaring, something that came up when I was watching Jeff Byard's slides from years and years ago, when there was a sea of Schweitzers out there. When you look out there and you think you could pretty, pretty much walk end to end from this, air, uh, this airport walking down 233 wings. Um, soaring has been a stronger community than it is today. It is still a strong community, but there's a paradox going on here. Soaring in and of itself by the basic physical constraints of our materials and of the air, road v squared and all that, that drives us towards single seat sailplanes. Soaring is a thing we tend to do alone, especially at the peak of performance. We do it alone, but we enjoy it most in the company of others. I don't know about you, but when I come back from a good flight, the first thing I want to do is find another glider pilot especially one who's out there with me, and talk about it. Because it's freaking incredible. What we do is take the, the essential materials of the earth and harness the essential forces of, na forces of nature and do amazing things. It's a dance with nature, a dance that we generally do alone with others. Teamwork uses community. Teamwork shares that vision of soaring with others as a force multiplier. Where are we? Let me take, give you an example of teamwork. And this is something that happened. This isn't like this is like this is two years ago, but it's still very strong in my mind. It's something that happened. It's one of those things where I thought I went into it thinking, oh, I'm going to do this great thing. And when it was all said and done, when it was all over but the shouting, and there was a lot to do when it was all over but the shouting, um, one of those things where I had this epiphany that, that, that becomes this talk that I'm giving you today. Um, let me see if I can step through this and make, 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 make it make sense. First, that is not a glider. But gliders are like Vegas. 
back up. Gliders are unlike Vegas. I said that wrong. Gliders are unlike Las Vegas. What happens in gliders does not stay in gliders. Once you mess around with sailplanes, you never ever look at an airplane and say, I'll bet this thing could use a little more aspect ratio. <laughs> so, L-39 jet, made in Czechoslovakia, came with tip tanks, and now, for whatever reason, people race them. Well, people race everything. People race sailplanes, people race tortoises. Okay, so people are racing L-39 jets at Reno. They go around the pylons. It sounds really cool, and they go about as fast as things go around those pylons. And my friend Bob Mills, a Reno racing pilot, got roped into flying an L-39, and he said, oh, I want to do something neat with this L-39. I know these fighter pilot guys, and I'll bet they can give me some aspect ratio for this jet. So Bob Mills, ropes his friend Steve Smith, a NASA, a NASA trained, Stanford trained NASA aeronautic engineer, into figuring out how much they can, how much aspect ratio they can add that, to that jet, how they would add it, and then come up with sort of an overall, uh, basically an OML, an outer mold line for wingtips that add aspect ratio to this jet to increase the O over D at 6 G's, which is important around pilots. So, Bob Mills asked Steve Smith to design a set of racing wing tips. Steve Smith ropes me into doing mechanical design for the attachment to the jet, and in kind of, since I'm the guy with all the square footage, in kind of like holding the project together. So I go to my friend, Brad Hill, remember him, the 3D design guy? I go to Brad Hill with a bunch of, remember that 2D stuff, slices of this wingtip and say, Brad, integrate this for me. So Brad Hill does a 3D design for these wingtips, and he hands it back to me, and I take it to Steve Smith, and through about three rounds, and this is our secret sauce, uh, Steve and Brad and I come up with a plan for some, for some non-linearities in these wingtips that help move vortexes outboard, which is, what, when it comes right down to it, that's what aspect ratio does. It moves vortexes as far as, far as you can get them. Um, um, and the secret sauce there is that if you do a straight loft, if you take a bunch of airfoils and do a straight loft through this crescent-shaped wing plan form, out about here, the the, the leading edge gets so sharp that at high alphas, like at 6 G's around pylons, you start shedding vortexes. Uh, basically, you get <coughs> separation about there. And what you want is separation there. So Steve and Brad and I have like three go-rounds where we do some non-linearities to the loft to make the leading edge much rounder here so that we move the vortexes outward. And then I go to my friend, Craig Caddo, and say, hey, Craig, I got, these, I got these SOLIDWORKS files from my friend Brad Hill. Can you please cut them in MDF? He says, OK. And the reason he said that is because he'd never cut MDF before, for which I am fortunate, yeah. because when he cut MDF, he basically ended up with his shop about knee high in MDF dust. <laughs> Nobody was happy about that. At least all the person had to sweep that shop. Um, but backing up a little bit, the neat thing about the teamwork of this project is that it constitute a huge effort multiplier, mostly as a time compactor. When Bob Mills finally wrote me a check for this to cover, to, to cover actually starting to do real work on it, it was 6 August 2016, and he needed those tips on his jet and flying 6 September, 30 days later. And that might sound like, oh, that's all, that's four whole weeks. That'd be easy if, one, if we were all working full time on it, but we're all weekenders. So this team managed to take Bob Mills' idea, get a check for it, and work with Steve Smith and Brad Hill and me to get files to Craig Caddo to cut big slabs of MDF that my wife Brigitte had glued together in our shop and delivered in our Subaru. Um, <laughs> A Subaru Outback, by the way, will carry 800 pounds of MDF, we discovered, fortunately. Um, so she delivers 800 pounds of soon-to-be dust to Craig Caddo. He cuts it, 
And then at the moment we get back from Oshkosh, um, well, that's when he started cutting, at the moment we got back, and then Brigitta, my wife, laid up the four upper and lower skins and the root ribs. Root ribs? Yeah. Well, they're root ribs for the tip, but they're tip ribs for the wing. You know what I mean. Oh, well. And then, uh, basically all of us, Steve, Brad, Brigitta skipped her. She was smart. Craig, Craig wasn't going to go. My friend Doug Gray, lighter pilot, um, and also the current builder of kit number three, um, collect ourselves at the Hollister workshop of Min Venator, and in two, two basically all nighters, we got the wingtips um, jigged to the jet, bonded together, assembled, and then attached to the jet with all the structural stuff, and then the fairing strips applied. And on 6 September, we flew this jet. Okay, we didn't fly it. Bob Mills flew it, but it flew. Um, 30 days from when we actually started work. 30 days from when we had the money to after that, we had tips on the jet and flying, and like a week later, it was turning blaps at Reno. Um, those tips will be back at Reno on this jet here. Um, this, is, this, this, this is the jet they're on. Well, I'm not going to bore you with the details. It was a team effort and the sort of thing for which there was absolutely no hope that any one of us, that any three of us, could have gotten all this stuff done. But because we shared a vision and we used, we shared resources and we used communities of force multiplier, we got this pretty amazing thing done. <laughs> you guys saw this one coming, didn't you? I'm not in a room full of dummies. You knew this was a sales pitch, right? You know what the sales pitch is? Join my team. I make gliders. And gliders exist in a converged solution space. So all gliders tend to look kind of like each other. And I've got all these big tools and molds and plans and drawings and fixtures for making glider wings and glider fuselages, glider tails, um, undercarriage, automatic connecting controls, air brakes, as feared and hated as air brakes are, um, full span flapperons. Um, I've even got molds for a touring, a motor in nose touring motor glider. So this is an appeal to you guys for force multiplication. I've got all this stuff, and I would be absolutely pleased as punch if we could work together and I could share the tools with you and share what I've learned and share the knowledge of the other people on my team with you to do some fascinating things in sailplanes, motor gliders, stuff like that. I was talking with Al a few minutes ago. Al said, hey, Bob, you think we can make a TC out of your stuff? Yeah. I think we can make a two-seater out of my stuff. Um, I, I mean, like right now we're working on front electric sustainer, an electric sustainer that, that has 4.2 kilowatt hours and 18 kilowatt, 4.2 kilowatt hours driving an 18 kilowatt motor that's basically a 5,000 foot up or 60 mile out, get out of jail free card. There's other stuff we could use that technology for. My friend Steve Smith, you remember that name that was on here. He's working on an electric self-launch version. 10 kilowatt hours of batteries in the wings, 36 kilowatts motor on a stick, folding prop, not a small prop like FES, one and a half meters or one and three quarter meters. We're talking about launching fully loaded off of a density altitude, air, airport at a density altitude of like 9,000 feet. And, that's, and with enough energy for basically 15,000 feet of vertical envelope, which is basically a weekend of soaring two launches and driving home. We've got these technologies, and if you guys can think of something you want to do, if you think, I've got a shape that would help you out, and when it comes down to it, it's all about shapes, we can work together. Say, for example, you want a low-cost 13-meter glider that's designed like to give up some of the quick build features that I've built in the HP24. Say you want a 13-meter glider 
based on my 15 meter cut down wings and a simplified fuselage, we could do that. Um, you want to try a jet sustainer, we could do that. There's lots of room in my mid fuselage for a jet engine, um, for batteries. You want to play around with BRS, ballistic parachute system like the Cirrus guys um, land in suburbia with. We, we could do that. I, I, um, I very, very specifically uh, allocated a bunch of mid fuselage volume for BRS. And I know we could do it because I made a hole for it. And if you don't fill that hole with the self launch, you can always fill the parachute. Um, so, two seater maybe? Yeah, we could do that. Uh, 15, uh, a 13 and a half meter, a 13 meter mini glider. Yeah, we could we could come up cobbled together something for that. We would cut some off the inboard end. We cut some off the outboard end. Let's not cut any out of the middle because that gets a little more difficult. Um, I don't know. Think on it. You can always get in touch with me. Um, I'll be here uh, all the rest of the day. Um, that's basically my talk on teamwork on motivation, on community, and my sales pitch, join my team. And by the way, if you want to just buy the straight kit, I can sign you up. We're laying down parts for number eight, but if you want, we can start number nine next week. <laughs> um, Q&A questions. Have I bored you to tears? Yes, Jerry. How, how did the wingtip perform? How did the wingtip perform? Yeah. Uh, in practice, um, under, I mean, the jets are extremely sensitive to atmospheric conditions, and Reno is all over the map. So it was about seven knots faster than the year before, but under slightly poorer atmospheric conditions. But it turns out that at Reno, seven knots is the quanta of passing. You need, you need seven knots on somebody. All the passing is on the outside. You basically can't pass unless you put seven knots into them. So we put seven knots into our jet, and we got like one extra pass, and and it was basically a wash. And 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 the owner of the jet. Important to understand about jet racing is that jet racing is a thing done by airline pilots with jets owned by millionaires, and it's not very often the millionaire that. Airline pilots are actual millionaires because they spend too much money on airplanes, right? <laughs> so, Mr. Millionaire looks at the performance and says, I don't like these tips. I'm not going to pay for them. So, my friend Bob Mills has a set of L39 wingtips, but no jet. What's he going to do with these things? He takes them back to me and he stores them in my shop. Next year, 2017, like, like about now, like, like September 6 or 7, I get a call from some guy in Alabama. Hey, you still. Bob Mills says you've got these wingtips in your shop. And I say, yeah. Can you, can you build a crate for them? OK. Uh, I, I call him back about an hour later. Yeah, I can build a crate for you, about 500 bucks. And it'll take him about two weeks to get there. And he says, hang on. I'll call you right back. 10 minutes later, I get a call. I got a guy come over from Reno. He'll be there in an hour. I'm like, <laughs> OK. So an hour later, pickup pulls up at my shop. They load the tips in. And two days later, they're on the jet. <laughs> and when they showed up at Reno, this guy was definitely, he definitely had the full 12 knots behind him. He was a motivated passer. He understood that, and this is important to understand about these, tip, these tips, aspect ratio helps you in the turns. It hurts you down the chute. So if you don't know that, if you think you're going to drive down the chute into, into pylon one and be ahead of anyone, you're not going to do that. You're, you're actually worse off because you've got more because you're not in the in the place in the in the in the in the induced drag versus parasitic drag where it really helps you. And as a matter of fact, it's hurting you a little bit. So basically what you're gonna do is you're, these things are your passing game. You're gonna lose a little down the chute, then you're gonna pick up pass, pick up pass, but you gotta know that. This guy knew that. And he was picking them up, put him in the gold race, put him put him within striking range of of the of winning the gold. And this year with other mods that we've sent him, that we think that he's got a chance. He's got to crank up his expensive IL-25 motor. He's got to run those turbine inlet temperatures a little higher than a lot of operators feel comfortable with. We think he's going to stand on the podium. Um, and here's the neat thing. The jet they took those things off didn't even make silver. <laughs> it was in bronze. 
So we think that atmospheric conditions kind of muddied it up so that the jet owner looks at these things and say these don't work. And I think that, we, that last year we showed him he's wrong, and I think this year we're going to show him he's very wrong because he's the guy we're competing against in this year's goal. Um, yeah, next question. Yeah, L. The picture you had of your sailplane that first day that Brad had one yeah. put together and you saw it fly, yeah. was that the very first time you saw all the parts in one place at one time? <laughs> <laughs> um, tech, ah, that's kind of the, 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 the that's, there, there's superstition there. Um, you don't want to see the bride in, in, in the gown before the wedding, right? Um, I, I, I think that's actually not true. I think I actually saw everything assembled when I went to a thing called ACA, at, we call our little get-togethers ACA fleets, okay, because I like, I like taking this highfalutin German word and, and placing it next to podunk American locations like Douglas Flat and Sultan Washington and Monroe Washington. Akafleet Monroe, what the hell is that? My wife hates the word. She says, call them build sessions. People know what building is. They know what a session is. I love that word. Okay, so Akafleet Sultan, Brad, gets, Brad and I get together. And what I'd done, I'd sent him off with wings with no holes in the wing spars, because I hadn't figured out how to drill them yet. So, so I sent him off with a right wing and a left wing, and the spar studs are completely blind, no eyes, no holes. So after that, after I sent out the wings, then I made all the fixtures and figured out how to drill those holes. And at Complete Sultan, we actually brought the fixtures up there, set the wings in the fixture, and bored through and installed the brass bronze bushings. And I think that's where I first like saw this thing and I, you know, there's something fundamentally different between a glider like the, with the wings resting on the wing stands. There's something distinctly unappealing about non-cantilever-osities <laughs> that, that are completely erased. When you see those wings like self-supporting, like wow. And I think Akafleet Sultan was the first time I actually saw, like we, we drilled the holes and then as Sonia is saying, we tried, went to put the wings on the fuselage and got the grinder out. And clearance here, and clearance there, and cut some parts away, and some filing. And then we're getting more and more desperate, and the files were getting coarser and coarser, and finally the pins went in. Or we took too much meat out of that thing. Um, so, so this is what's going on now. Those guys like those tips so much that um, about a month ago, I get all these phone calls. Hey, Bob. We like those tips we saw on that on that other jet last year. Can you make me a set? And I looked at my calendar, and I tell people there's a 10 week there's a there's a 10 week lead time on these things, just because putting all the resources together takes a lot of time. And it was two days before we were into that 10 week period, so I had to say yes. So we made another set of these wing tips. Remember this guy, Doug Gray? That man is an adventurer of the highest sort. Um, he's come, he's come to, to, to do all these weird things with this. Um, he keeps coming back more, so I don't think, even though, even when it's all over with the shouting, but there's still plenty of shouting to do, he still comes back. Um, so we put another set of these tips on a different jet. Um, this, one is, this one's unusual. It's actually being fly, flown by the millionaire who owns it. Um, so, so these things better work. <laughs> yeah. um, and, 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 and this one, oh. We'll get into it. Tips, jet, aspect ratio, uh, gliders, what stays. Okay, and, and here's another neat thing we, we were doing. Um, this is not my design, but this is a part I have fabricated. This is the back end of an L39 jet. It turns out that the, they must have gotten really tired of designing jets when they got to the back of this jet because they did a really poor job designing the uh, nozzle surround and the aft fuselage closeout. Um, here below the vertical stabilizer and above the, the main floor of the nozzle. They did a really poor job. So um, I borrowed somebody's mold and manufactured this fairing for the exhaust nozzle in, on L39. This is on, that, this is on that same jet that's got my wingtips on it. And this is, this is one of a couple of reasons that we think that this, that this guy's going to stand at the top of the gold podium. What else is going on this year? Because I know you're going to ask. Auto flap. Um, I know 
there's this internet meme that like a, a stick shift is like a millennial anti-theft device. Um, and let me tell you, I used to think that too. And then, I, and then I found myself working in the Silicon Valley at a job where I had to drive in commute traffic. And let me tell you, rowing through the gears, up and down and up and down and up and down, you know, doing the clutch, other foot, other foot. Um, man, it gets tight. And I'm kind of joking here, but I'm not joking much because everything you do takes attention and takes physical activity and adds fatigue. And every bit of fatigue you add to your life subtracts energy you could be using to do something else. So I love my Volvo 240 with the M46 gearbox with overdrive. But man, at the end of the day, it was sucking energy out of me. I had to let it go. I had to get an automatic transmission. And then I found I got to the office with more energy. Um, so I bought a Miata. <laughs> But that's just for weekends, you know? Um, but, in any case, auto flap, sailplanes. Um, flap settings are actually really kind of deterministic. They follow a curve. You go faster, you pull the flaps up. You go slower, you put the flaps down. It turns out there's like three parameters that you can get away with. Um, total lift, which you can extract from uh, mass and G, and speed. If you got those things, you can closely approximate a reasonable flap setting and there's no reason for you to be doing this thing in your head and then doing it with your arm and then like a minute later when conditions have changed doing it all over again why freaking bother a computer can do stuff like that so my friend Bartek Klusik another a person who I should have mentioned earlier because it's all about vision and teamwork he came up with this device actually he'd already come up with this device years ago it was a flight computer that was going to compete about against stuff that turned out was better and and made his thing uncompetitive. But he he, he in the same way that I had accidentally designed the perfect sailplane for electric self-launch by making it too light or with too much wing area, depending how you look at it. He had actually he had accidentally designed a perfect computer to as a platform for my auto flap system. So this is what we're going to do this winter. We're going to put it in 2403. Um, and it's, it's all basically functional. We just need to install it and build chassis work for it. Um, uh, let me think. I think that's, oh yeah. Um, oh, and we're on number eight. We're on number eight now, by the way. Um, it was, I think it was, I think I was just selling number seven when I talked to you guys last, number eight. Um, I'm hoping to make at least a dozen of this basic configuration before we start doing anything really weird. Um, that's how to find me. Um, I, and I think the next slide fades to black, so I won't go there. Um, any further questions, comments, concerns, like, Bob, you're crazy? <laughs> Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any question whatsoever anymore. You're a bundle of energy. I try to be. It keeps me going. That's how you get things done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.